Welcome to The Cognitive Crucible, produced by the Information Professionals Association. Our website is information-professionals.org, where you can find links and information about today's conversation and get access to members-only content. Join John Bicknell and explore all aspects of our generational challenge, cognitive security. The Cognitive Crucible is a forum that presents different perspectives and emerging thought leadership related to the information environment. The opinions expressed by guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the views of or endorsement by the Information Professionals Association. My guest today on The Cognitive Crucible is Jake Siegel, who is Senior Editor of News at Tablet Magazine. Jake Siegel, welcome to The Cognitive Crucible. Hi, John. Thanks for having me. So the conversation I'd like to have with you today, Jake, will cover a recent article that you wrote for Tablet called A Guide to Understanding the Hoax of the Century, 13 Ways of Looking at Disinformation. And we will have a link to this in the show notes for interested listeners to go and check that out. But before we get into this topic, Jake, do you think we could start by getting your just overall assessment or general comment about the times in which we live? Yeah, sure. I think that we live in um, confusing and uh, somewhat chaotic times in which there's not a clear strategic picture that projects the national interest out into the world. There is a kind of ad hoc strategy for attending to the power and position of a ruling party in the United States. And I say that shortly after we just celebrated Independence Day without any satisfaction. Um, You know, I am a partisan of the American cause. And so it's, I'm not somebody who comes naturally to uh, this kind of broadside against um, American politics, but that's where I think things are now. I think that the effect of the internet as a uh, a destabilizing force that um, upended established hierarchies, that the challenge presented by digital technologies, which to be clear is an enormous challenge and even a capable and competent leadership class in the United States would have had difficulty managing it. It's a, a like a scale of change on the order of the movable type printing press. Um, But we didn't have a competent leadership class in the United States to deal with it. We had a kind of um, senile and corrupt leadership class. And the the reasons why it became senile and corrupt, we can get into. But anyway, this senile and corrupt leadership class, seeing the challenge posed by the same digital technology that they had once heralded as as a great force for spreading democracy across the world, seeing that now it was challenging them, they responded in the most inappropriate way, which was by trying to put the digital genie back in the bottle effectively and trying to seize control of the internet in a kind of authoritarian fashion, which is what began happening in 2016 in the U.S. and, and in European, some European countries in response to the challenge of populism. And we are still living in the aftermath of that reactive attempt to put the genie back in the bottle. So um, that's where we are now. And I think that basically every decision made by the leadership class in the United States at this point boils down to, and I know this will sound cynical and reductive, but I think it's it's essentially true is that all of their fundamental decisions are guided by what will keep them in power. Um, And that is both a reflection of real sort of cynical self-interest on the one hand, and the fact that they have come to believe that they represent all good in the world and that therefore keeping themselves in power is the only way to preserve the progress of humanity. Um, and uh, so we, we, we covered a lot of ground there, but that's how I see it. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, just to, to our audience, um, you know, the, this podcast, the Cognitive Crucible, it is not 
a, a, a partisan political podcast, but this this uh, episode, perhaps more than uh, some other or, or most other episodes, you know, is probably really going to brush up against some live uh, live wires in uh, especially American uh, U.S. public discourse. Uh, but again, the, the intention is not to uh, have a partisan discussion, but really I, I wanted to have Jake onto this, uh, onto this show uh, because he's got an interesting perspective, which is uh, you know, valid, uh, you know, valid in, in that he, he has his observations. And so I, I wanted to ask him on to help unpack those. Um, and so before we continue on, uh, uh, Jake, I think it might also be helpful uh, if, if you give a quick, download on your uh, background. You know, we, this podcast, you know, we've got a lot of military and government folks that listen to it. Uh, and uh, you, you've got an interesting background. And I just wanted to make sure our audience knows about it. Yeah, sure. I grew up in uh, Brooklyn, New York. And, um, you know, middle class family sort of uh, was on the track to go, you know, was in college in 2001 when um, the attack on America occurred and I enlisted in the army shortly after that, uh, postponed my college plans, got a commission as an intelligence officer. And you know, subsequently I was in the National Guard. I, I deployed to Iraq in 2006, 2007. I was there for 15 months um, during the surge partly as an intel officer, part of the time as a convoy security platoon leader. And then I was in Afghanistan in 2012. I spent about half my time, total time in the military, uh, about 15 years. And about half of that as an intelligence officer, half of that as an infantry officer. Um, and, uh, you know, as far as like where I'm coming from and what my politics are, I don't really have a strong political or ideological orientation. It's not mm -hmm. how I come at this. It's not my primary, it's not the primary lens. I'm not, you know, I'm not loyal to either party. I'm not really interested in party politics in that way. I'm interested in history and I'm interested in cycles of civilization. I'm interested in ideas and, and I'm interested in being true to my own experiences. So that includes, um, you know, my experiences, my very profoundly disillusioning and sobering experiences overseas. And, you know, while my deployment in Iraq was far more brutal and more violent and more kinetic than my deployment in Afghanistan, it was less sort of disenchanting in part because it was all on the ground, moving fast, um, not really analyzing things. Afghanistan, when I got there in 2012 and I was in RC West, yeah, which was, you know, relatively speaking, obviously, but a, a fairly stable, uh, fairly non-kinetic environment while I was there with some exceptions and uh, Herat in the north of RC West was much different than Farah, which was on the uh, edge of the Pashtun belt to south. But overall, you know, it was much, it was an easier deployment. It was also, I was only there for six months, whereas I'd been in Iraq for 15 months. What, uh, time, in, what time frame was that, Jake? <clears throat> I think we got there in March of 2012 and well, uh -huh. six months, six months after March. I mean, I'll tell you a quick story just about how crazy and chaotic things were at the time. I was a, uh, I was in a different unit when the, uh, when the brigade got activated, uh, put on the, the mobilization calendar. And I was in a different battalion than the one I deployed with. And the battalion I was with actually wasn't going to go because they had been on the last rotation. There were two big infantry battalions. I was in one and had already done a previous deployment, so now they were taking the other battalion. And I was serving as an infantry officer at the time. And then when the deployment happened, they were originally supposed to go as a full-up full, up, full up infantry brigade. 
uh, going to RC East. And they were supposed to be going to be battle space owners in Paktika, which was a super hot, like it was going to be a very hairy, mm. very difficult deployment. And so my old battalion S3 asked me, would I go as the intelligence officer? And I said, yes, because they were going to be battle space owners in RC East. And I thinking like, well, I can't say no. If they need me, then I'm going to go. If I'm told like we need you, how can you say no to that? Right. So I said, yes, that deployment got canceled because they were turning over. There wasn't going to be a new brigade level battle space owner in that AO. So then the deployment got canceled. Then the brigade got remissioned to Kuwait. And I was losing my mind because I was like, I don't want to go to Kuwait for a year. That's, uh, you know, I was in the National Guard at the time. I'm like, let me go. You don't need me for Kuwait. Let me go back to my life. And then at the last minute, just my battalion got remissioned again and sent as just uh, our battalion, but plussed up with some additional assets, sent to RC West. So all of those changes took place in the span of like, I think that was all within the span of six months. So, you know, and I bring this up and it's relevant because it was very chaotic. Mm. And the whole time as the Intel officer, I'm trying to get a handle on what is the situation? Who is the enemy? What are we focusing on? And what is the mission set? You know, and I, so that's where my head is throughout all this chaos. We get remissioned to RC West, we go to RC West, and almost as soon as we got there, it was a very strange deployment for me because we were technically not battle space owners, but we were, we operated as battle space owners because we were responsible for securing Highway 1 in RC West. But technically, our AO only extended like 50 meters off the highway in either direction. But because we were the only conventional maneuver battalion at the time in all of RC West and the actual uh, regional command was under the Italians at the time, every kinetic mission went to us because, you know, when there is one American maneuver battalion, one American infantry battalion, you're effectively the only game in town. So we... We're getting all of these missions thrown at us while at the same time, our own mission was never really clear. And then on top of that, we knew we could feel the pressure coming from up top that everything now was about transitioning the AO to the Afghans and going through these tranches and training the Afghan National Security Forces. And long story short, none of it, added up. It didn't make any sense fundamentally what we were doing. I could see on the ground that the Afghan forces who we were supposedly training didn't exist in any meaningful sense. Okay, yes, you could find a a squad's worth or platoon's worth Mm -hmm. of good fighters who would show up for a particular battle, because maybe they were loyal to that particular Afghan commander or they were loyal maybe to an American commander or they were protecting their own interests in this particular fight. But the idea that there was a national army, right, in the way that we have a national army in in America, the idea that us showing up and doing spot checks on their weapon systems or taking them through squad battle drills or whatever was adding up to a Afghan army or an Afghan police force that was going to be able to carry up these functions that we associate with a national army or a national police force was a farce. It was obviously not true. Anybody looking at it could tell that it wasn't true, but we were all going along with it because that was the mission. We were trying to to do the best with the mission at hand. And it led to these very uh, I think strange and unfortunate situations where as Americans, because it's in our in our national blood, as it were, in our national mythos that like we can do anything like, you know, you, you drop a 
drop an American infantry battalion in the middle of the desert anywhere. And, you know, we're going to try and make, we're going to, we're going to try and build a city, you know, we're going to try and, and remake that place in our own image effectively. And, and there are very good aspects of that. And there are some dangerous or delusional aspects of that, but it's in our national character to see things that way. So I remember when I first got on the ground in Afghanistan, the, uh, it was either the S3 or, or the XO of the, the unit that we were replacing said to us, hey guys, this isn't Iraq, you know, like that was, uh, that was, that was high school war, you know, just like, that was a shooting war. That was, that was low level stuff, primitive stuff. This is graduate level war. That was what they said to us. And it was only years later that I realized, oh, yeah, that's exactly true. This is the graduate school version of war. Like, it's full of um, inflated obs- and deliberately obscure premises that hide its essential confusion and valuelessness. You know, I don't mean this as like an attack on all people who have gone to graduate school or academics or whatever. My father, both of my parents, in fact, are, are academics. but. Uh, you know, I think it's fair to say that at this stage, the American in graduate school institution produces a lot of phony degrees. There's a degree of sort of inflation of, you know, essentially bankrupt concepts, et cetera, et cetera. So it was only years later that I realized that this guy's analogy about Afghanistan being the, the graduate level war was correct. And that's where I'm coming from. And, and and seeing in that environment in Afghanistan the ways in which this fundamental lack of strategic vision, what are we really trying to accomplish in Afghanistan? Why are we still there? Is it really to bring women's rights to young Afghan girls? Is it really to to create a gender egalitarian society? Like if that's the case, why are we also um, you know tacitly condoning uh, child rape, you know, like these two things, they can't both be true. And, and and do we really believe that we're going to be able to create a nation state, a modern nation state in Afghanistan? Like, have you ever been to Afghanistan to believe that that Helmand and, and Paktika are going to be joined with Herat in some kind of modern nation state? It just, it made no sense to me. But what what I did see, what I, I could tell was happening was on top of this strategic confusion, there was this super powerful architecture of surveillance and data aggregation. And as an Intel guy, you know, that's, I was in the nerve center of that, <clears throat> excuse me. And what I saw us doing was acquiring more and more data and analyzing it in more and more sophisticated ways and getting nowhere because none of it addressed this fundamental strategic vacuum. All right. Well, uh, you said a lot there. And uh, I guess, could I just maybe p- paraphrase grossly what you were saying? Uh, so, you, I mean, you you served in the Army. Uh, some of your experiences in Afghanistan uh, where these are my words, not exactly yours, but it seems like you've had some uh, experiences which uh, ultimately just didn't make sense. Either the mission didn't align or it was uh, uh, a a fool's errand to try to do what we uh, ostensibly were saying we were wanting to do uh, in Afghanistan and probably Iraq as well. But all of this is informing your current uh, outlook. And when you overlay on top of that your your intelligence experiences and uh the way you saw data being used that all of that carries right on through to today and presumably uh, informed this article that you wrote earlier this year is that is that a fair recap even if it's a very high level yeah no it's that's absolutely fair uh it's a good recap the one thing i would add to that is just that uh, none of that has any bearing on, you know, my personal feelings about my army service. So I see. Yeah. Still some, still some of my closest friends, um, still uh, experience that I, I'm proud of that, 
I don't have any regrets about, but mm -hmm. um, I I can't I can't uh, I I can't just pretend that the emperor has clothes when I saw the emperor didn't have clothes. You know? I see. I see. All right. Well, uh, uh, that's great, Jake. Maybe we can uh, step into your article just a little bit more. And like I said at the top, there's a link in the show notes for for interested uh, audience members to check this out. But uh, you're you're describing something that you call the hoax of the century. Could you describe what you mean? Uh, what what is this hoax? I think the hoax of the century refers to the false claim that the U.S. was under attack from disinformation and that a uh, foreign disinformation attack launched against the U.S. in 2016, principally from Russia, through collusion with Donald Trump, through infiltration of social media. You know, there's a sort of, uh, this is defined all sorts of ways, but all amounts to the idea that there is this new entity, disinformation, which represents a kind of weaponized untruth, and that the U.S. was under attack from that disinformation, that it represented an existential threat, and that in response to that existential threat, in order to preserve the American way of life, in order to defend the nation, we needed to um, abandon or at least significantly modify the constitutional protections around speech in the U.S. in order to allow disinformation, security professionals to monitor, surveil, censor speech. And, and the hoax is that such a threat existed because there was no existential threat to disinformation in 2016. There was no Russian collusion. Um, over and over again, um, these grossly overhyped threats turn out to have been free texts or power grabs to allow a technocratic ruling class in the U.S. to hold on to its power by silencing domestic opposition. I see. Um, let me linger on this for just a moment. Um, so um, are, are you... Do you believe that uh, nation states such as Russia and, and China also are, in fact, engaging in influence operations on America in general? I mean, set, setting aside you know, what you described started happening in, in 2016, but I, I, it's it's so easy to like mix mix things together, and so I'm I'm just trying to separate things out. So do you, do you kind of get how I'm trying to separate this out? Just a little bit? yes, of course. Russia and China are both involved in influence operations targeting the U.S. as well as other countries, um, and those influence operations do take on a new character in the internet age. So um, this is absolutely the case, and in in a very limited way. Some of the claims about Russia's interference in 2016 were true, right? It's just that they were trivial compared to I what see. was imputed to them. So, for I instance, yeah. take the famous Facebook ad bias, right? You're familiar with this, right? Yeah. So the original claim was that, that Russia had influenced the outcome of the election through this infiltration of Facebook. Then when you look at the ad purchases, they amount to roughly $100,000. And they're split between support for Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. And that support is like a very kind of sloppy, scattershot, meme-driven approach that, yes, is trying to sort of destabilize the American political situation and, and add to the chaos, but doesn't meaningfully impact the outcome of the election. So absolutely, there's a kernel of truth. Yeah. But that kernel of truth is exploited um, by people who end up launching much more consequential influence operations targeting American citizens. I see. I see. So you're you're saying that um, our in, sticking with the United States here, um, is, that our political 
uh, class, our uh, general leadership, our um, uh, our uh, jumping, our, our using using these legitimate influence operations as a pretext towards um, additional control of society or something along those lines. Is, is would you say that that's about right? Yeah, yeah, I think you just hit the nail on that. Okay, well, um, so how, how do you believe that uh, you know the these these leaders are uh, morphing uh, disinformation or you know using uh, today's influence the uh, today's technology uh, in turning it into a tool of governance? Okay, so what you're alluding to there is the sort of central uh, claim or the the central theoretical premise of my piece, which is distinct from other exposés of uh, disinformation. So whereas like the Twitter files, for instance, Michael Schellenberg, Matt Taibbi, Glenn Greenwald, all people who I think have done very valuable work on this have focused on censorship primarily. My, what I am saying is that the counter disinformation apparatus, this thing that grew out of these, the claim about this information, which brings together sectors of civil society, NGOs, universities, government agencies like the Global Engagement Center, cybersecurity and infrastructure security agency, uh, CIA, FBI, that brings them all together in this large multi, uh, party apparatus or infrastructure that what they are trying to do is not just to censor speech that the aim of that censorship of speech is not simply to repress ideas that are dangerous perhaps misguidedly thought to be dangerous that they are trying to replace the processes of liberal democracy which require a constitutional democracy, if you prefer, which require an open and free society, able to entertain debate, able to uh, exchange ideas in an open and free forum, that they are replacing that with a, a mechanism of information control that aims at engineering certain outcomes to keep them in power. So an example of that is the Election Integrity Project. Mm. So the Election Integrity Project was this massive, mostly uh, clandestine is too strong because it did have a public space, but massive, highly opaque project that did have a public face, but also concealed much of what it was actually doing that brought together CISA, Stanford University, an organization called Graphica that had been founded during the war on terror and has now been a counter-terrorist uh, company, uh, you know, private company, and, and now has taken on the sort of leading counter-disinformation role. It brought them all together, uh, along with a whole number of other organizations I'm not naming, but suffice to say this was a very large public private consortium brought them all together nominally to monitor uh, the the electoral infrastructure of the US online to look for disinformation right so nominally the mission is you know we are going to protect the integrity of American elections by keeping foreign disinformation uh, out of public discourse mm -hmm. but um, what they actually did was carry out a campaign of vast, uh, unprecedented censorship that purged constitutionally protected speech from the internet, which is the public square today. And they did so explicitly to prevent one candidate from getting elected, that was Donald Trump. Uh, and to ensure that his, uh, or to do everything possible to try to help his opponent, Joe Biden, get elected. And you, you see a, a very similar network uh, 
at work during the Hunter Biden laptop scenario, for instance. So you, know, you can say now that we know beyond any possible doubt that these were in fact Hunter Biden lap Hunter Biden's laptop in Biden's own lawsuit now attests, and, and that the claims that they were disinformation and reporting on them needed to be censored was just a case of overzealousness or, or erring on the side of caution. You know, you might have been able to say that that was the only event of that nature that you're dealing with. But when you look at the Hunter Biden laptop case, in conjunction with the election integrity project, in conjun conjunction with the virality project that grew out of the election integrity project and mm -hmm. applied the same AI powered tools of mass censorship to pandemic related narratives, when you look at all of these things together, what you see is that they're not simply cases of overzealous national security officials, you know, trying to protect the public. There was nothing to protect the public from in the case of Hunter Biden's laptops. The FBI took possession of those laptops in 2019. The FBI knew in 2019 that they belonged to Hunter Biden. And yet the same FBI or uh, representatives of that same FBI went to Mark Zuckerberg in the summer of 2020. And, and warned him, right, that there was a Russian disinformation operation coming down the pipeline concerning Hunter Biden's laptop. So, you know, as we say in the Army, like the, you know, that's prepping the battlefield, right? They're setting conditions by doing that. They're telling Zuckerberg, you better go along with the censorship when this comes out, because we now have a paper trail showing that we warned you. And if you don't censor it, then we'll be able to say, hey, look, Zuckerberg is helping the Russians again, right? So this is the federal agencies of the United States deliberately tipping the scales in the election. And I don't think they're doing this because they're such great fans of Joe Biden as a candidate. I think they're doing it in order to preserve their own institutional power and position. And they have grabbed onto this new digital architecture of information control is the way to do so. And I, look, I, I am sure that um, talking to you about this in the way that I'm talking about it, you know, puts me on any number of lists as a uh, as a suspicious character who, who ought to be monitored and surveilled. And I'm sure I'm already on many of those lists if I'm even important enough to be on those lists. And so all I can well, say is, yeah, well, so, well, well, so something that uh, discourages me when I, you know, watch various different like news outlets, you know, uh, the sor sources where lots of people get their their uh, information is the, uh, you know, lack of trying to like paint a full picture or mm -hmm. lack of of you know what's called like like steel manning the other side and so i mm -hmm. I, I guess I, I i wanted to ask if you could do that you know what what would you say to somebody who has their arms crossed right now and uh is just like you know this this guy jake is just like a one-sided guy and he doesn't even understand what what the other side might might have legitimately been thinking so do you do you have any thoughts about you know what what is the most favorable yes, light yes. that that you could shine on uh, what has been happening over the last few years? Yeah, I think a lot of decent, honest, well-meaning Americans have been deceived and co-opted into this focus. And so, what I would say is that I don't mean this to impugn the character of individuals. Now. I find it very difficult to steel man the larger argument on mm -hmm. Biden laptop, for instance. I don't think there's any possible reasonable defense of shutting down legitimate First Amendment protected reporting by one of the oldest newspapers in the United States, right, based on totally flimsy, vague assertions of some undefinable Russian disinformation. I thought that that was uh, a, a, a real Rubicon being crossed. And I thought that the the way that the journalism industry as a whole, my colleagues in the journalism industry, went along with that and, in fact, cheered on the censorship was disgusting, uh, total abrogation of their responsibility. So I, I can't defend the way that played out in particular because I think that any halfway objective accounting of 
what evidence there was for the laptops being Russian disinformation, which was none. You know, there was no evidence suggesting that. Um, so, so what happened there, I don't see how it can be justified. All I can say is I understand that there is an emotional component to this and that the people are told the president of the United States is a Russian asset, um, that they have an emotional response and that people get swept up and that there's a kind of moral panic effect. And look, my best friend, uh, who I served with in Iraq, who was one of my team leaders in Iraq, went on to work for an NGO in Afghanistan, was actually working for that NGO in Afghanistan during the same time I was there. Uh, he, he had gotten out, I should say, he had ets from the army and he had gone back to work for this NGO mm -hmm. in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And he and I had very different views. I, I had come to, of Afghanistan, I, mean, I had come to see this sort of whole NGO humanitarian complex and Afghanistan is doing really very little good and as sort of having this um, symbiotic relationship with the national security mm -hmm. state that kept the war going forever, even though it wasn't accomplishing anything because it created a lot of jobs for people. But I don't think that applied to my friend. I love this guy. I, I served with him. He's an honorable, upstanding American. He thought he was doing a good thing. He thought he was doing noble work. And, and in his own narrow lane, I'm sure he was because he's an honorable American, but that doesn't mean that it was having uh, a good effect on the world or that it was contributing to the national interest. Yeah. So I, I don't mean any of this to impugn individuals. Um, I, I, you know, if right. I want to impugn individuals, I'll name them. There are people who I think should be called out, but it's not the vast majority of people who thought that they were doing good work and and who maybe have been led to believe that um, that the Russian disinformation threat was greater than it was. Let me add one more very quick thing. Sure, sure. The yeah. one other thing, the one other thing I would say yeah. on a structural level is that there really is a threatening, destabilizing, chaotic thing going on in the world that's being driven by digital networks, right? I understand that. I know that that's occurring, and it's you know it's the same thing that the State Department was cheering on when it led to the Arab Spring, and when they saw it as a tool for um, you know essentially affecting regime change in other parts of the world. Um, and and so like I, I understand that we're at the beginning stage of a a massive upheaval that is changing everything. And I think Russian disinformation and disinformation and misinformation, malinformation is a kind of crude face to put on this much larger, much less uh, narrowly or, or mm -hmm. much less simplistic white and black face. Like we are facing an enormous, enormous challenge and and it's the challenge of the digital age, and nobody knows what to do about this. I don't know if you've had Martin Gurry on your program, but he's a former CIA analyst. No, we've he not. He's written about this. Uh, I, I think he's written about this uh, very insightfully. We're facing this enormous challenge, this mm -hmm. total, total sort of everywhere all at once challenge to establish narratives, establish hierarchies, and that's that that can freak people out, understand them. I mean, I also think, you know, just to put a final point on this, like, I understand why Trump freaks people out. Trump freaks me out. You know, so none mm -hmm. of what I'm saying is a defense of Donald Trump as an individual or as a president. It's just the response to all of these things, which was to effectively try and shut down uh, a legitimate election to cast mm -hmm. American voters as insurgents and then apply the tools of digital counterinsurgency to American citizens is absolutely the wrong way to go about things and, uh, and unconstitutional. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, as they say, and as you've been describing, Jake, you know, uh, uh, more than one thing can be true at once. Uh, it can be simultaneously true that we are, in fact, uh, in 
a uh, 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 like a generational challenge moment uh, where we have uh, all of this new technology which can um, uh, exacerbate or uh, you know can uh, de destabilize societies you know the new new forms of information attacks even if some of the uh, ways that the attacks are uh, rooted might be as old as as uh, mankind itself but so that can simultaneously be true and as you mentioned up at the top I believe you know you can really potentially like like nug this right down to uh, some really human uh, tendencies to look out for yourself and just cling cling to power and I I, I do tend to think that that uh, seems to be the case that you know our political class um, is unfortunately uh, uh, you know some people in our political class are unfortunately comfortable with really playing with fire uh, along these lines and doing whatever it takes for them to stay in power. And uh, uh, both of those things, I, I think, unfortunately, can be true at once. And it really makes for this uh, toxic stew that uh, uh, you've been writing about uh, so, um, so elegantly, uh, Jake, over the last a uh, few months and years. Um, well, so this has been great. Um, I, I'd like to maybe do a lightning round and, and then close out. Sure. Uh, so lightning round, I don't know, 30 seconds or so per, per response, something like that. Um, Twitter. Uh, Twitter, you know, I, I am astonished that Musk making this decision to reduce scraping essentially uh, had the effect that it had. I mean, my short thing about Twitter is like, the less people use Twitter, the better. And so um, whatever affects that is good, in my opinion. And, you know, I think free global social networks are, as Marshall McLuhan pointed out a long time ago, basically a path to the world war. Okay. Um, the The notion of continual competition compared to kinetic fighting? Yeah, uh, kinetic fighting. A war should have beginning and, and beginnings and ends because the point of a war is to restore peace. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't compete with nations in other ways, but the blurring between the state of war and the state of peace, which has taken place in the U.S. and in the minds of the U.S. leadership over the last, uh, really the last half century in particular, has been utterly disastrous. This continual warfare, hybrid warfare, whatever is um, is a blight on the nation. Um, and last lightning round. So we we had a episode with a friend of yours, John Askinus, a few weeks ago, Jake, and he he actually suggested that you be a guest here. But one of the things we talked about with John was this notion of technological homogenization. And I wanted to get your hot take on that. Yeah, I mean, John's very bright. So I, I would, uh, whatever he said, I'm sure was right. But when I hear <laughs> yeah. technological homogenization, you know, what I think is like this flattening effect that digital technology has, where rather than accentuating difference and and this sort of spikiness of like, you know, people speaking in different tones and registers and regional cultures flourishing. What you have now is a sort of single global monoculture that is, um, you know, not not to my liking, to say the least. Right, right. And people talk about the the large language models being a contributor to this kind of a uh, uh, dynamic where uh, people are looking to AIs to kickstart their thought processes on all kinds of stuff, right? But that that takes away that initial deep thought and, and the creative uh, nugging through, uh, how am I going to say this? How am I going to put this in a way that's inspiring? It, 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 it kind of short circuits that, that human process, which could have uh, some problems down the line. Yeah, it takes away the necessary failures that you know are the path to breakthrough. Mm, yeah, yeah. 
Well, um, I think that's as good of a place as any to uh, leave off. Um, I, I, again, I encourage our audience to go check out uh, Jake's article and also check out tablet magazine in general, a lot of uh, a lot of interesting stuff on the times in which we live uh, via that uh, outlet. And with that, Jake Siegel, thank you so much for being a guest on the Cognitive Crucible. Hey, thank you, John. Just uh, if anybody listening feels that I really got something wrong or, you know, you want to talk to me or, or tell me why I'm wrong, feel free to reach out. Jake is Siegel, S-I-E-G-E-L at protonmail.com. Email me there. Um, my email is on my Twitter handle also, and you can tell me why I'm wrong. I'm always willing to change my mind. Excellent. Thanks so much, Jake. Thanks, Chuck. The Cognitive Crucible is the only podcast dedicated to increasing interdisciplinary collaboration between information operations practitioners, scholars, and policymakers. To find out more about the Information Professionals Association, visit us at information-professionals.org. Please support our podcast by giving us a five-star rating and leaving a review.